because it's too fast. They are killing people. They are killing children faster than anybody can count, that anybody can document, that anybody can create a record. And and all of the human rights organizations were really good. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Spath, and I'm uh, the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. We're really delighted to have uh, Miranda here uh, uh, to speak to you tonight. Miranda Cleland is an advocacy officer at Defense for Children International Palestine and lives in Washington, D.C., where she advocates for the human rights of Palestinian children. DCIP, Defense for Children International Palestine, has recently sued the Biden administration for failure to prevent the genocide of the Palestinian people. Miranda also directs the No Way to Treat a Child campaign. And so we're really delighted, Miranda, to welcome you here uh, to Plymouth Church and the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. Miranda, take it away. Her topic, her topic is a child's eye view of Gaza. Hi, everyone. It's my first time in Fort Wayne, and I am so excited to see so many friendly faces, people who care very much about the Palestinian people and Palestinian children. I grew up in the Midwest in southern Illinois, so this feels like a very comfortable and welcoming space for me. So thank you to everyone, uh, especially Michael, who has been such a great host um, while I've been here in Fort Wayne. Can everybody hear me? Okay, is this no? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yes and no. Okay, I'll, I mean, I'll see. Yeah, I mean, raise it just a, is this better? Okay, okay. All right, so my name is Miranda. I'm an advocacy officer at Defense for Children International Palestine. All right, Nakia's gonna drive our slides, I think. Um, Defense for Children International Palestine is a local Palestinian human rights organization. Uh, it's been around since 1991, and it is the only Palestinian human rights organization focused exclusively on the rights of children. Uh, DCIP is based in Ramallah in the occupied West Bank. Uh, we have field offices in Nablus and Hebron, and I'm the only member of the U.S. staff. Uh, so all of my colleagues are, are based in Palestine. Um, We've been around since 1991, and we provide legal aid to children who have been arrested and detained by the Israeli military and prosecuted in Israeli military courts. We investigate, document, and expose human rights violations against Palestinian children um, with a focus to fatalities, injuries, detention, and torture. And we work to hold Israeli and Palestinian authorities accountable to universal human rights principles um, by advocating at the international and national levels to advance access to justice and protection for children. So my focus tonight is on a child's eye, child's eye view from Gaza. And I, I, I phrased it like that because we, I, I do want to include not just my voice and the, the point of view from a human rights organization, but from children themselves. So we do have some short videos kind of interwoven throughout the presentation. So you can hear from children in Gaza and in several cases, their parents um, as to what they're experiencing right now. Um, and I want to start, next slide, by Introducing a man named Mohammed. He's there on the, the right side of the, the photo. Uh, Mohammed has been DCIP's field researcher in Gaza for more than 20 years. Um, he started off as a volunteer right after he finished college himself, and this has been his entire career, documenting human rights violations against children. Um, here he is with his family. Um, he started at DCIP as, as a bachelor and has now been married and has four children. Um, the youngest of which, Amino, who was born just just after Israel's May 2021 offensive on the Gaza Strip. Um, and I, I say all of this because history did not begin on October 7th. 
And if you go to the next slide, um, Gaza has been under Israeli blockade for more than 15 years. Um, Gaza is, is part of the occupied Palestinian territory. Uh, and so Israel controls really every aspect of life there by land, air, and sea. Um, Israeli authorities control everything that enters and leaves Gaza, whether it be food, water, medicine. Um, they control access to electricity, to fuel, uh, and people. People who move in and out of Gaza is all done um, with permission of Israeli authorities. Um, Gaza experienced regular electricity blackouts uh, with many days having just a few access a few hours worth of access to electricity. Um, and people there, uh, many people lived, you know, under very high levels of poverty and unemployment. And um, on the, the next slide, one thing I, I really want to highlight, and whenever, whenever we talk to Mohammed about what he really wants to highlight about the situation for Palestinian children is the extreme difficulties that children have, really all Palestinian patients, but particularly children, have accessing specialized health care. Um, so th this photo is from a, a feature article that we wrote a couple years ago um, that included the stories of three children from Gaza um, who, one of them had leukemia, one had a brain tumor, and one had a heart defect. And all of them required specialized care from hospitals, uh, mostly located in Jerusalem. So there are a number of, typically if a patient from Gaza has to, to receive some sort of specialized care, that's, that, that type of care is usually available in a hospital um, some, somewhere in Israel or, or perhaps the West Bank. Um, but in order to leave Gaza, um, that child must receive permission by, um, from the Israeli authorities. Um, that includes permission for an initial visit, if you want to go to have a surgery, if you want to go to have follow-up appointments. Um, you know, many of these are conditions. There are a lot of children with thing, chronic conditions like kidney failure, cancer, things that really do require ongoing um, care that really cannot and should not be interrupted. Um, and these, these three children that we reported on were all children who died from their diseases while they were waiting for an approval. Um, because it, the, the process had been prolonged or delayed so many times. Um, and even as, as far as children who do receive permission to travel, many times there are a lot of difficulties in um, uh, a, a parent or family member receiving permission to travel with them. So sometimes they're allowed to, a parent is allowed to travel with the child, but maybe not allowed to stay. So there have been cases where a child under a prolonged hospitalization is there alone without their parents or, or without anybody to be with them. Next slide, please. A 16 year old Palestinian child, uh, and, a, and as a reminder, a child is anybody under the age of 18. Um, they've already lived through, this is still before October, five major Israeli military offensives on the Gaza Strip, um, starting in, in 2008. And that, that brings us kind of to August, 2022. Um, these were all major, major aerial attacks, um, by the Israeli military to, you know, many of them were indiscriminate bombings. Um, some of them, dozens of children were killed in the summer of 2014. I'm sure many of you remember that that was, um, sort of the longest military offensive up until this point It was 50 days and Israeli forces killed 535 Palestinian children in Gaza over the, it was like a July into August. And up, up until October, that was, that was sort of the biggest thing, um, the biggest moment that um, children and their families had, had lived through. Um, and thinking back to Mohammed, our field researcher in Gaza, he worked and continues to work at DCIP through all of these military offensives. He started in the kind of the early mid 2000s. And for all of these offensives, he was able to keep up. He documented every single one of those child fatalities 
in Gaza during every single one of these offensives and every day in between. Um, so, you know, these these mentioned up here really only account for um, sort of specific major military offensives, but there was also the Great March of Return in 2018, where Palestinians in Gaza regularly um, demonstrated at the Gaza, near the Gaza perimeter fence, um, and they were met by uh, live fire from Israeli forces. And, and during those regular protests, um, many children and, and other demonstrators were, were maimed because soldiers were aiming for their legs. Um, there have been other periodic airstrikes and bombings um, sort of in, in between here, or, or sometimes there have been children who uh, find something called uh, a UXO, unexploded ordnance, some, uh, sometimes of sort of unknown origin. They'll pick it up, looks like a toy, and it explodes. Um, so Mohammed, up, up until October, you know, has been with us for 20 years and has been able to, he did it. He documented every single one of these killings, um, which is his life's work. Um, you know, he's really dedicated his life to, um, documenting, um, these violations and, and, and working to make, make his home a better place. Next slide, please. The last piece I sort of want to mention about what Gaza looks like before October um, is the issue of mental health. Um, Save the Children put out a really comprehensive report in June of 2022. They had done a very extensive study on sort of the state of, of children's mental health. And the numbers were really astounding and um, really you know, fearful to think about what these numbers could look like now. Um, there were, in, in June of 2022, 84% of children felt fearful, 80% felt nervous, 77% felt sad or depressed, 78% are grieving, um, 55, 55% of children had contemplated suicide, and 59% of children uh, self-harmed in, in some way or another. Um, so there was al already this crisis of children's mental health. Um, before October, many of these children had only known a life under blockade. And so that's, I mean, that, that, that's kind of what we were starting from in, um, in October. Next slide, please. Um, so now we're going to we'll talk a little bit, and I just chose kind of a few focus areas to, to talk through um, when we talk about what the last six months of genocide have looked like in the Gaza Strip. Um, so that this, this next part, we'll, we'll focus on a few main areas. The first, um, I am, we're going to play a short video. Each of these is only, only about two minutes, um, where you'll hear from a 12-year-old Palestinian girl named Dunya. If you want to go to the next slide, you might have to click twice. لما ضرب ضرب تاني علينا طبيب ولا جبت له حوار عرفت إن رجلي مبطورة لأنه كان في دم وما كانش ما كانش في إيدي بدون لو كنت حركتها ما كانتش حاجة إيه طبعا بتشهد اللي هم ماما بابا أخويا محمد أختي داليا حدا يطلع لي برا وهو يصفرني برا أي دولة إني أطلع برا بس عشان أركب رجلي وأصير أمشي عليها زي الناس، يعني عشان أصير أمشي أطلع أنزل ألعب مع أخواتي، أصير دكتورة زي هدول الدكاترة اللي بعالجونا عشان برضه إحنا نعالج أطفالنا، أنا بدي إشي بدي إشي واحد بس إنه يتخلص منهم. So this is a, a video that Mohammed, along with a videographer, were able to film right at the very end of November, which was during the seven-day 
truce agreement where people were, you know, for the first time in a long time, were able to sort of move around with some semblance uh, of safety. So Mohammed and, and a videographer sort of traveled to um, traveled around, talked to some children and their families, uh, mostly in some of the hospitals in, in southern Gaza. And I remember I, I reviewed a few versions of this video before it was ready to publish. And um, it was, you know, really right in the middle of December and we were getting ready to publish it. And we had a few others we were working on. And um, we got the message that Dunya had been killed. And this, the, the video was already ready to go. And we couldn't even manage to, to get it out in time before she was killed. And um, if you, you, you might have remembered this, I know there are so many stories to remember in the last six months, but um, hers received a, a, a little bit of news attention. She was recovering in Nasser Hospital in southern Gaza, um, and an Israeli tank shell came through the, the side of the hospital. It did not explode, but it hit her right in her bed while she was sleeping. And um, I, Dunia's story in so many ways, I think really, um, it is the distillation of the Palestinian child's experience. She was only 12 years old. She was displaced from her home. Then she and her family were bombed and most of them were killed in the bombing. Her leg had to be amputated because she was so terribly injured. And when she was finally recovering in a hospital, a place that is supposed to be safe and supposed to help you recover and feel better, she was killed. And that was all over the course of a month and a half. Um, if you go to the next slide. I might have to click it again. And you can see. Um, so Dunya is one of at least 14,500 Palestinian children who have been killed by the Israeli military in the Gaza Strip since October 7th. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this this number because I think there are still still some misunderstandings about how these death counts are are collected and, and what these numbers really mean and how how we should understand them. Um, so this number is from the Ministry of Health in Gaza, and the Ministry of Health is able to officially report deaths that happen in hospitals because there are Ministry of Health staff that operate out of the hospitals or if somebody dies and their family member reports the death to the Ministry of Health. Um, given everything that we know about the healthcare system and how Israel's attacks have totally forced the healthcare system to collapse, given that we know somewhere around 8,000 people, including many children, are trapped under the rubble of destroyed homes, many of whom are presumed to be dead and are not included in this count. Um, we should understand this number, and whenever you see an update to the number of the death toll, whether it's be children or the total, to be a vast undercount. This is a vast underestimation of the amount of people who have actually been killed. Um, and even that, even, even knowing all of that, it is so shocking that more than 14,000 children have been killed in less than six months. And I, I remember that back in October, after all of this started, I, I was thinking about what, what my job has looked like during past military offenses. I had been working at DCIP for the August 2022 offensive and the May 2021. And that was really, you know, every morning I'd wake up and Mohammed had sent us all the documentation he managed to collect the day before, children's names, ages, date of birth, what happened, um, who the perpetrator was, just really trying to piece together those last moments. And um, this, this is always, always very difficult work reporting on um, 
you know, the, the killings of children and trying to piece together what those last moments look like. And, and a lot of times, you know, you're, he's interviewing family members at the worst moment in their whole lives. Um, and the, the comfort that I always took in, in doing that work, which is so difficult, um, and very, it can be, can be very draining at times is I would think, you know, we are creating a record of what happened to these children to do everything that we can to make sure it does not happen again. We have their names, we have their ID numbers, we have their, their exact ages, we have a document and a, and a record of exactly what happened to them um, so that they won't just be a number that, that people can brush off or, or ignore. And I remember, I think it was about a week into, into everything in October, and at that point, Mohammed sent us a message and said he was from the north. He got he, he is from the north in Gaza and said, I had to move my family four times yesterday. I can't send you anything else. And so, you know, we said, just do what you need to do. Don't worry about us, you know, take take care of your family. But I remember thinking it was just a week. And the child death toll was getting close to a thousand. And I. I had this moment and I thought, we're not going to know all of their names. We're not, I'm not, go we're not going to be able to do it because it's too fast. They're killing people. They're killing children faster than anybody can count, that anybody can document, that anybody can create a record. And, and all of the human rights organizations were really in the same, same boat and, and, and continue, continue to be in that, that, that same boat. Um, and I really think, and I was thinking this, too, when, when the number was getting so high so quickly that these numbers are, are too big, I think, to really promote for, for any person, I think, to really understand what it means to have more than 14,000 children who have been killed. Um, because I, I really think if you were, if you were to sit and really feel what it means for 14,000 children to have been killed, you wouldn't be able to get out of bed every day. Um, and so, so that, that's really where we're at six months in. Um, if you go to the next slide, we're going to hear from a little eight-year-old boy who's in a star. And um, I hope his video makes you smile a little bit because he, I think, just has the sweetest face. <laughs> أنا اسمي سائر رهون عمري ثمان سنين نزحنا من الشاطئ وانقصفنا في البريد أنا صابت في مدرسة اسمها شرق البريد كنت ألعب بالساحة لهو صار غصب وكوبت في راسه فجأة لقيت حالي بالمستقبل كنت قاعدين نلعب في الساحة كانوا صغار فجأة صارت قصف من قذافة الدبابة رموها وقصف صواريخ زمانة برضه مع ضغط الصاروخ تائب طار وانخبط في كرسي حديد مخه صار طلع برا راسي ما حملته وجيت فيه على المستشفى يعني وخلص قالوا انه استشهد كنت يحاول مع الدكاترة انهم يسعفوه وكذا والحمد لله عملوا العملية وقاعد أسبوع في العناية صحي بعديها لا بحكي ولا بتحرك قاعد ثلاث أسابيع زي لا حركة ولا كلام مع الإصابة صار عصبي عصبي جدا يعني فوق ما تتصور أي إشي عطول ديك سير بدي يخبط وصار عنده حساسية في المنطقة الإصابة هذا كتير بيحط فيها وطلع له حساسية فيها من محل الإصابة وهذا آه غير الخوف وين ما أروح بضلوا جنبي حتى في الليل بينام جنبي برضاش يسيبه بقول لي بخاف بخاف بلاش يقصفه بلاش يسيب قصر نفسي أتعالج برا وسفروني وأتعالج زي الأطفال ونفسي ألعب كرة قدم ويزرعوا العظم ويزرعوا العظم
Can we go to the next slide, please? And uh, if you So in Gaza right now, there are an estimated 17,000 or so. It's, this, is number, this is a number that, that's hard to estimate, um, children who have been injured, um, whether that was in an airstrike, uh, from tank shelling, um, from live ammunition, uh, from soldiers, Israeli soldiers who, who were on the ground in Gaza. Um, and one thing I, I really want to highlight and that I think um, we really need to keep top of mind is the continuing care that these children will need, many of them for the rest of their lives. Um, there are, UNICEF estimated a couple of month or two ago, it was, there are at least um, a thousand children who have lost either one or both uh, legs. And child amputees who receive a prosthetic need a new one about every six months because they're, they, especially because they're growing, until they're done growing, they, they need a new one. Um, many of these children will require physical therapy. They'll require specialized care from hospitals that, hospitals that, that might have once been functioning in Gaza and just simply are not anymore. Um, and I, I know there are a number of very good efforts. Um, uh, I'm thinking of the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund and uh, Heal Palestine that, that have started the process of, you know, sort of one by one being able to sort of sponsor a child to go and receive medical care abroad. Um, but this, that is, it is terribly expensive and difficult work. And as we sort of see how the world and, and especially the U.S. Um, continues to react and, um, you know, what, whatever policy suggestions are, are put forward, I think this, this issue of injured children needs to really stay top of mind because it's simply not sustainable to fly them all to New York uh, for surgery, especially when there, there are so many and um, they're, you know, they, they will really need sustained continuing care um, and supplemental care like physical therapy, uh, many of them for the rest of their lives. Um, and we'll play on the next slide. There's one one more video that we're going to watch. أنا بنتي بالليل بتسرق بتسرق من كتر يعني الوجع اللي هي فيه وأنا حاليا مش متوفر إلى علاج ولا أكل هذا إلى أكل خاص مش متوفر نهائيا في المكان اللي إحنا فيه هنا. أنا بنتي هذه كان وزنها 15 كيلو بنتي حاليا عظم العظم بين من كتر قلة في الغذاء ما فيش غذاء إلا ما فيش أكل خاص إلا هنا مش موجود نهائيا. إحنا نعيش في هذا الخيمة زي ما أنتم شايفين في مكنة هذا المتواضع بنعيش فيها سبق انفار يعني دورنا لز بعض لز حياتنا هنا مأساوية جدا ما فيش فيش إمكانيات للحياة هنا بالمرة لا كهرباء ولا مية ولا أكل ولا إشي صحي بعدين بالنهار بتكون شوب شوب حريقة بنتي هذه بتتشنج من كتر السخانة والحرارة في الخيمة بتتشنج وأنا عن جد والله مش عارفة شو أعمل معاها تعبت كثير كثير تعبت هنا في الخيمة هذه أطفالنا بتموت إحنا أطفالنا قاعدة بتموت منا حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل يعني بدنا إحنا العالم ينظر لنا بعين الرحمة تعبنا تعبنا شوف البنت شوف إيش حالها صار شوفوا كيف حالها صار عظم عظم البنت صار Go to the next slide, please. Um, and, and been been our team just finished this video two days ago, um, and I was was really glad that it was finished in time because I, I really wanted to show a, a family talking about the starvation crisis that is happening right now in Gaza. And I want to start by saying malnutrition is not a death of natural causes and using starvation as a weapon of war in order to attack the conditions of life is an act of genocide. Um, it is written in the definition of the Genocide Convention and it is 
very clearly um, the way that Israeli authorities have um, systematically and deliberately blocked and severely restricted humanitarian aid and regular everyday goods from entering Gaza in the last six months. Um, be before that, certainly, but really, you know, escalated in the last six months um, amounts, amounts to genocide. It is no accident that children are starving to death. Um, according to the Ministry of Health, um, there have been at least 28 Palestinian children who have died from malnutrition and starvation. And this is, this is very recently. This is in the last month or two. And I want, I want to talk a little bit again about what this number means. Um, because this is from one hospital that has been able to report it. Um, the Ministry of Health can only report deaths that are hospitalized or that are reported to them, which means this is another number that we should understand to be a vast underestimation of how many children are actually starving to death, um, dying of malnutrition and dehydration. Um, most of these children who have been confirmed dead from malnutrition have been newborn babies which means that their mothers, their pregnant mothers, were malnourished for months. In the final months of their pregnancy, were not getting enough to eat, not getting enough to drink. Um, and so their babies were li literally born starving. And some of them, you know, only lived a few days. The other children, um, several of them were, were a little bit older um, and had some form of, of disability or chronic illness. And I think which which highlights that malnutrition is is a condition that that does target very very young children and children with disabilities children who require special diets um first they are the most vulnerable to malnutrition and dehydration um because their bodies are not able to to get the nutrients that they need um The other thing I wanted to say about, about this number and this issue of malnutrition is that I imagine there are a lot of children in Rasha's position and that her family, the position that her family is in now, and her death is not inevitable. Malnutrition is preventable and it is treatable if children are able to receive the proper care from doctors that have the resources that they need. And so every death from malnutrition, dehydration, starvation, these deaths are not on accident. It is not a, a fatal disease that you catch and you're never able to recover. Um, this is something that if these children are able to receive care, they should be able to recover, um, which means every one of their deaths is a choice. Next slide, please. So, that's sort of where we are right now, sort of the, the state of childhood in Gaza and in a little bit about what it's like um, in children's own words and in the words of their mothers. Um, next slide, please. And so, so I want to talk a little bit about where, where we go from here and where, where sort of our focus should be as, as things move forward. And before we kind of get into the, the policy details or or specific demands or things, I want to share this quote from a book that I've been reading, edited by Rebecca Solnit, and it's a collection of essays and reflections from people who have been very active in the climate action world for a long time. And it's a new book that came out, and it, the point of it was to show that actually there has been a lot of progress, and there is a lot of reason for hope, but hope is a choice that you make. Um, and so I'll, I'll just read this, but it's something that's really been resonating with me and I think is, is important to keep kind of in the back of my head as we think about how we move forward from where we are right now. The hope is to accept despair as an emotion, but not as an analysis. To recognize that what is unlikely is possible, just as what is likely is not inevitable. To understand that difficult is not the same as impossible and to know that the future will be what we make of it in the present. Next slide, please. 
And so with that, I want to talk about several of these I've sort of mentioned um, mentioned sort of earlier, but I, I want to highlight a few areas of areas of concern that that I think we really need to keep a, a laser focus on as things move forward. Um, I know so many things have been happening in the last six months, both in Gaza itself, in Congress, with the president, in the streets. There's been a lot happening and it happens very quickly. And there have certainly been times where I feel like it is easy to get, get distracted, especially from people um, in the opposition who would like us to be distracted um, and, and waste our time on, on things that really at the end of the day don't matter. And so I, I wanna highlight just a few, few things that we should keep top of mind as the US and our elected officials make policy decisions, as the UN makes decisions um, and, and, and things kind of, kind of in that ballpark. UNICEF estimates that there are about 17,000 children who are either orphaned or unaccompanied. Some of these children are now tasked with caring for their younger siblings and do not have an adult in their life to, to help them. Um, this is an incredibly vulnerable group of children who um, are at risk for all kinds of things, um, especially if there is any, if people are forcibly displaced to Egypt, um, especially if people are forced to move really anywhere, they, these children are, are at a high risk for a number of things. Um, I mentioned healthcare for injured children, especially amputees, children who will need continuing care for things, um, and, and amputees who will need new prosthetics um, once or twice a year, as, as long as they're growing. Um, Save the Children and UNICEF now say that one million children are in need of really urgent mental health support. Um, you may know that that's pretty much every child in Gaza. There are about two million people who live in Gaza. Half of them are children. And so we're really talking about every single child and probably every single adult that's really in urgent need of mental health services and who have been living, living in you know, a very traumatic environment um, uh, for the last six months. Um, there, the, the last thing I'll mention sort of on this slide is there, there does seem to be an indication that at, at some point the Israeli government will attempt to forcibly displace Palestinians in Gaza to camps in Egypt. And that is something um, we really need to be opposed to. And Palestinians and their families who were kicked out of their homes in 1948 know that if, if they leave, if they're kicked out, they will not be able to go home, almost guaranteed. Um, so that's, that's one thing we really need to keep pushing against. Next slide, please. Um, another thing I, I wanted to mention, mostly because there's actually very, very little information about it, which is on purpose, um, it hasn't been, been covered in the news too much here, but if, if you watch Al Jazeera or some more international news, you have probably heard of Israeli forces detaining people from Gaza and taking them to uh, detention centers, prisons, military bases inside southern Israel. Um, there have been many reports that children, especially teenage boys, are included uh, in those who have been rounded up by the Israeli military. and. There has been basically no information released about these detainees. Um, we, so we don't know how many children, we don't know their names, their ages, where they're located, how they're being treated, if they are being charged with a crime. Um, there's no indication of when they will be released or returned to their families. Um, there's no indication how they're being treated, although um, just yesterday or the day before, I think, um, UNRWA released a short report. They've been collecting information on detainees who have actually been released um, by Israeli forces very recently and have been documenting many cases of um, torture, 
sexual violence, um, people being deprived of food, water, medicine, sleep, um, and re really just, you know, very, very basic human rights. So um, this is something that's really not getting much news coverage here in the U.S., but um, this is, you know, I, I think some of, some of you know part of what we do at DCIP is um, <clears throat> provide legal aid to children in the occupied West Bank who have been detained by the Israeli military. Um, and that is happening under a totally different system than what is happening to children in Gaza. Um, the children in Gaza and the adults in Gaza who are being detained are being detained under a law called um, the Unlawful Combatants law under Israeli civil law and under military law in the occupied West Bank. Um, children are arrested um, based on security concerns and would be prosecuted in the military courts. So so this is really um, this is happening sort of outside an existing system, um, which historically human rights groups have been offered some transparency into um, you know, in order to be able to provide legal aid to children who have been detained in the West Bank, and that is not happening um, with uh, children who have been detained in Gaza. I'll go to the next slide, please. Um, I mentioned that there are a lot of a lot of things happening, a lot of things moving very quickly. And so I just wanted to highlight a few different accountability mechanisms, sort of keep an eye on and, and, and try to follow. Um, and I listed so many because I really do think that we need all of them. Um, I think many of you know that the last six months have highlighted the, the limitations of the legal system, both in the United States and the international legal system. Um, it's highlighted a total lack of political will from the United States and other states to prevent Israeli authorities and the military from carrying out genocide. And so I really, I don't believe that any one method is going to be the thing that ends this. I really do, I really do believe we need all of it. Um, and I'll, I'll go through these just, just briefly, but, but as I do, I, I want everybody to think about the thing that, that they can do in the space that they, they sit in and the communities that they're a part of and, and think about what you can do in that space and, and don't feel like you have to do everything because we really need everybody doing their own um, do, doing their own piece. Um, so there are a couple of major cases kind of going through the International Court of Justice process, um, which is the South Africa v. Israel case, where South Africa is sort of invoking the Genocide Convention against Israel. Um, the court has issued some provisional measures, um, sort of um, basically saying, you know, while we consider the case to decide whether or not this is genocide, um, it probably is, so please stop doing, and they have a, a big long list of, of things that they've asked instructed the Israeli military to stop doing. Um, the other case which um, would be good to keep an eye on is uh, Nicaragua v. Germany. And, and Nicaragua has actually taken um, Germany to court in the ICJ um, for their support of Israel's um, genocide of Palestinians. So it'll be interesting to see how the court rules on that case, because it could lay the precedent for other states, such as the United States, um, to be taken to the ICJ um, from, uh, from from other countries for their support of, of the genocide. Um, the International Criminal Court, which is different from the International Court of Justice, um, their role is prosecuting individuals who have been charged with um, alleged war crimes. Um, so one thing that they do, and everybody, of course, is hoping that they do soon, but they do seem to be taking their time, um, they have the ability to issue arrest warrants uh, for people who are believed to be war criminals or to order other people to carry out war crimes. Um, 
these arrest warrants would probably be issued for people at the very high level. Um, so people like the prime minister, uh, secretary of defense, um, generals, maybe people who are people who are pretty high up would be maybe the ones targeted by International Criminal Court. Um, there has been a lot of really good grassroots organizing um, that I've felt very inspired by. There are a lot of groups, especially people who live near um, major weapons manufacturing sites or the offices of places like Raytheon or Boeing. Um, people have been doing really great work disrupting the work of those manufacturers, protesting outside of it, closing off the roads. Um, a few months ago, I remember there were organizers in Oakland who they held up a boat at the port of Oakland that was carrying weapons. And I remember just feeling so inspired by, you know, it was only a, a dozen people or, or so, but they, um, they, they held it up and I think it missed its, you know, it, it didn't, didn't turn around, but it missed its next stop and was a pretty significant disruption um, to sort of the, the travel of weapons. Um, BDS, of course, boycott, divest, sanction is, is a very powerful tool in our sort of accountability and organizing toolbox. Um, I know there are a lot of boycott campaigns and people who have been more interested in boycotting not only um, Israeli companies or companies that are owned by um, Israelis, but also companies that are complicit in, in the genocide of, of Palestinians. Um, so it, it's, I felt that it's, it's been inspiring to see so many people um, re really take that up and, and think, um, think about what they should and should not be buying. Um, the other sort of, which I do consider an accountability mechanism has, has been some of the organizing around um, the elections in, um, in the United States, especially the Democratic primary elections. Um, starting, I mean, right here in the Midwest, it started with Michigan, but the uncommitted campaign, which is where um, basically people organize to get people to, instead of voting for Joe Biden on their Democratic primary ballot, you could instead select uncommitted, which shows that you are not committed to voting for Joe Biden in November, which sends a message to him as someone who will certainly be the Democratic candidate um, and Miss Michigan, I believe, got more than 100,000 people who submitted those. And in a swing state, especially the Midwest swing states like Michigan, um, that's a really significant amount of people. And um, the hope is that that, um, that should scare him and his campaign team at least a little bit um, to hopefully, you know, push them to change his behavior before then if he is interested in getting those votes. Um, and, and sort of on top of that, I have really appreciated all of the people who, um, I, know, know, I know there are a lot of them because this has happened in many states, people who have um, really worked to disrupt Biden's campaign events and, and really worked to make sure um, that he knows that we have not forgotten this and he, um, he should not count on our votes if he continues um, supporting and, and paying for the genocide of Palestinians. Next slide, please. Um, speaking of Joe Biden, um, Michael mentioned this uh, in my introduction, but I just wanted to talk a little bit more about this case because I also kind of put under the the bucket of accountability mechanisms and things that are in in pro in in process. Um, so DCI Palestine is the lead plaintiff in a federal lawsuit against the Biden administration, namely um, President Biden, Secretary of State Blinken, and Secretary of Defense Austin for their roles for failing to prevent genocide and for continuing to support uh, the Israeli government and the Israeli military as they carry out genocide against Palestinians. Um, <clears throat> when we filed that lawsuit, um, we asked for a preliminary injunction, which is basically an emergency order. Um, we know that the courts move very slow, and this is an emergency, and we need you know, action right away as quickly as possible. You can see it still took them two months to schedule a hearing. But um, 
the we were asking for an emergency order for the judge, federal judge, to instruct the Biden administration to stop supporting um, the Israeli government and the Israeli military. Um, that hearing, uh, surprisingly, was in person. Um, it was in Oakland, California, and I was able to go. And DCIP is the, the lead plaintiff, but um, there are a, a lot of additional plaintiffs, including Palestinian Americans um, uh, who are from Gaza and have family in Gaza who have been killed. Palestinians in Gaza are plaintiffs. Um, and, and another uh, human rights organization named Al Haq, which is sort of the largest, um, oldest human rights organization in, in Palestine. Um, so, so all of those people testified in a federal courtroom as to their experience and their family's experience um, under this genocide and how the Biden administration has been complicit. And I got to tell you, listening, it was about three or four hours of testimony. And I, I could tell that it had a pretty strong impact on the judge. And he really felt like he, he seemed to feel like he wanted to to give people their their day in court. Um, Despite that, he did dismiss the case. Um, <laughs> um, the judge did end up dismissing the case, which is more or less what we expected. Um, it was based on the political question doctrine, which is the idea that um, foreign policy is something that's managed by the executive branch and the courts do not have any oversight onto that. And, and our argument was, well, we can't just let the president do whatever he wants with no oversight from the judiciary. That is, in theory, a foundational part of this country, that the branches are supposed to have some, some checks and balances on each other. Um, so we will be appealing this case. The appeal is not until June. It's in San Francisco. Um, but one very important thing is he did mention in his sort of final ruling, he dismissed the case, dismissed the primary pre preliminary injunction, but if you notice that the our hearing January 26th was the same day that the International Court of Justice announced their provisional measures against Israel. And it was, we were in Oakland and got up at four in the morning to watch it because we were able to send what the International Court of Justice said to the judge in California and say, hey, just so you know, this is what they said. This should probably, you should take this into account in in your ruling, and he did. And he said in his, his order that um, Israel is plausibly carrying out genocide, um, and he strongly urged the um, the executive branch to reconsider their support uh, for the Israeli government and the Israeli military. Um, so we we considered that, um, that, that a win, in a way. But we are appealing, so we'll see what happens in June. Um, there won't be any further testimony. It'll be um, in an appellate court, so people will be um, discussing the, the political um, question doctrine. But um, yeah, hopefully we'll have more to share on that in, in June. But this felt like something really important to do as something that um, is proactive in pushing back against the Biden administration. And um, especially for the Palestinians and Palestinian Americans who were able to testify in U.S. federal court that then became a record of the court what their experience was and what the U.S. government's role has been in the genocide of their families. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so I've got a big long list of demands on the screen behind me. And I put this big long list because I really do think now is the time. Now it, it feels like we're at a tipping point, that we're at a crossroads, that we need to ask really big. Um, this is the moment, even though it, I know it feels like we're losing. Um, now is the time to ask and demand an end to the Israeli military occupation, an end to the Israeli apartheid regime, and an end to the genocide of Palestinians, um, and that all Palestinians, including children, need to have their basic human rights, which Israel has agreed to uphold under international law, under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. 
Um, I really do think, you know, these, these are big asks and these are big things and, and big changes and these aren't, it's not an easy goal, but it really, this is really the bare minimum of what is required in order to ensure that children and their families have the rights that they are entitled to and the rights that they deserve. Um, so, yeah, that's that's what I've been thinking about. And I, I was typing this all out and I was like, man, that's a lot of stuff. Um, but this, and I was thinking about it again, it's like, this this is it. This is the bare minimum. This is what we need to get to before we can even get started on thinking about what it means to help people thrive in, in the land that they've lived in for, for so many years. Um, next slide, please. This is my, my very last slide. And I share this, this tweet from Dr. Hassan Abu Sitta, who is the Palestinian British doctor um, who was in Gaza at the beginning of the genocide and left, I think sometime in December, he was able to leave, but he's a plastic surgeon and, and conducted many, many um, surgeries and procedures on injured Palestinians, including children. And, and now that he's back in the UK, has been engaged in a lot of advocacy on their behalf. Um, and I really, really liked this because I, it is so hard to think about tomorrow. And there are, there are times, you know, waking up and doing this work and seeing like, God, the death count is that high. There are 14,500 plus children who have been killed in the last six months. You know, how do you even begin to think about what tomorrow looks like, much less, you know, six months from now or next year or 10 years from now or... Um, you know, when all of these children grow up and have families of their own, what does that look like? It's so hard. Um, but I've been trying to do it. And I'll read this quote and, and sort of close from there. And then I think we can, we can take questions. But um, I've been sitting with this and wanted to share it with you all. Part of our resistance to the finality of genocide is for us to talk about tomorrow, plan for tomorrow, work on healing the wounds of our people. The aim of this war is that there would be no Palestinian tomorrow. We own tomorrow. Tomorrow is a Palestinian day. <laughs>